Good day, Grand Tens. My name is Kaden Mazokere. I'm the author of the Distinction Bound Student Textbooks. Welcome to lesson number 59 from my textbook, the Grand Ten one. Well, I've written the Economic Grand Ten 11 and 12, and uh, I've published Business Studies Grand 11 and 12. Now, in this lesson, we're going to talk about prices. Well, this is Unit 5 of Dynamics of uh, Markets in Grade 10. So this topic is very, very important because it's going to actually prepare you for both Grade 11 and 12. And you are going to use this information even when you move to uh, tertiary education. Now, we're going to show you how the demand curve is constructed uh, from a demand schedule. So obviously, we're going to introduce first the demand schedule. You're going to see what a demand schedule is. And then from there, we're going to proceed with the lesson. So this is 59. And as we go to up until I think 64, 65, somewhere there, uh, we'll be doing the whole demand and supply thing. So we, we first want you to understand demand. Then we make you understand supply. And then we put them together to show you how prices are determined. All right, so I'll see you just after the break. During the break, like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And thank you, I'll see you just after the break. As usual, we start with our homework. Right, uh, the first question was, define the phrase disposable income and then discuss factors that led to the growth of global consumer market of electronics. All right, there we go. Disposable income is household income that is left over for spending and saving after tax has been deducted. So basically, it's the money that comes into our pockets after government has taken what is theirs. Okay. Then the factors that led to the growth, there we have them. Increase in disposable income, which is the term that we just defined just now. Reduced prices of consumer electronics, improved standard of, uh, standards of living, and then technical advancement and availability of a wide variety of products. Right, uh, there's nothing difficult about this homework. It was an easy thing. Let's dive into today's business. Right, um, as I said in the introduction, today we're going to talk about demand. Okay, so it's lesson number 59, like I said already. All right, uh, the first term that we have to define obviously that's the term for the day or that's the main term in the in this lesson so what is demand all right when a market is competitive its behavior is well described by the supply and demand model which we are going to go in depth with because many markets are competitive the supply and demand model is a very useful one indeed Okay, we're going to see how it's constructed and we're going to see how to go about it. There are five uh, key elements in this model. The first one is the demand curve. Okay, you are going to see how it slopes. Does it slope downward or it's upward sloping? Uh, but you can still, you can use your grade nine, your grade eight, seven, whatever uh, knowledge. You, you try to remember was the demand curve downward sloping or it was upward sloping try to remember okay the next term is uh, oh the next thing is the supply curve same applies one of these two curves that i just drew here okay um let me just put uh, our axis okay so which one one of them is a demand curve one of them is a supply curve so which is which we are going to find out shortly uh, the set of factors that uh, cause the demand curve to shift. Well, if this one is the demand curve, what factors could cause it to shift either to the right or to the left? Okay, uh, to shift and the sec set of factors that cause the supply. If this is the supply curve, what could cause it to shift to the right and what could cause it to shift to the left we're going to look at all this and then the market equilibrium okay so basically for us to say we have an equilibrium uh, it means we need to have a demand and a supply curve so those two the point where they meet 
is our market equilibrium okay that is where uh, two things are determined i don't want to go into depth uh, because this is just an introduction sort of okay so the equilibrium price the equilibrium quantity all that stuff and then lastly the way the market equilibrium changes so this equilibrium it can change causing this to go up or down causing this to go down or up okay so obviously you can see from from here uh, that uh, demand and supply they do shift so when those shifts happen uh, what is it that we can say okay so this is basically what we're going to go into and uh, this lesson is very very important uh, you are going to uh, it's going to prepare you for grade 11 it's going to prepare you for grade 12 so uh, actually um this is i think my third lesson uh, for grade 10 and i've jumped a lot of other uh, lessons and i've jumped to do this one uh, so that it can also if if let's say grade 12s are struggling with a certain concept i can link them back to this particular video because of its importance not just this one the ones that are coming after it uh, the whole thing of demand and supply i'm going to link them back to this one because it is of paramount importance all right demand is the amount of goods and services cons uh, consumers are willing okay first and foremost i'm going to talk about this one here willingness simply means you want the good and then willingness alone is not enough and you must also be able to acquire the good now what does ability mean ability means you can afford the product okay so demand is the amount of goods and services consumers are willing so you are not going to demand a good that you can afford but you don't want it so you are not going to demand it so for us to say you demand a product you have to be willing to acquire the product and you have to be able to acquire the product so to buy a certain uh, or oh, at a certain price at a given time so you will see that a uh, difference in price will change that willingness okay so in other words demand is going to change depending of uh, depending on the price as well okay we're going to show all this and how it happens so how many kilograms of coffee beans i'm going to use coffee beans in this particular lesson as an example actually i'm going to continue with uh, the example of coffee beans up until we get to our equilibrium point okay so how many kilograms of coffee beans do consumers around the world want to buy so want to buy uh, that's what is going to give us the demand for coffee beans in a given year of course or in a given month whatever we want so you might at first think that uh, you can answer this question by simply multiplying the number of uh, cups of coffee that are drunk uh, around the world each day by the weight of the coffee beans it takes to brew a cup of coffee and multiply that by 365 so then by so doing you think uh, oh it will be so easy we just go to starbucks we go to all those manufacturers ah, the, the 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 companies that give us coffee we just do this but obviously it wouldn't be like that because demand is not only shown by the number of people that are going to purchase it's going to depend on a couple of other factors all right we're going to show you what factors shortly so but this isn't enough like i've already explained to answer the question because how many kilograms of coffee beans consumers want to buy are therefore how much and and therefore how much coffee people want to drink depends on the price of coffee beans so it's it's not as uh, as simple as how many cups did we buy and so that is our demand multiply that by uh 365 days in a year and then we say so this is our total demand for coffee it depends on the price of coffee beans so if we're having if we're going to have different prices for coffee beans you'd see that um maybe more will be consumed maybe less will be consumed so the point is 
what consumers ultimately buy uh, does not really ref reflect uh, the, 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 the total demand. Uh, that particular demand is shaped by the price of whatever it is that we are buying as consumers. Right. Uh, I hope I made myself clear right there. So when price of COP fee rises, as it did in 2006, some people uh, drink less, perhaps switching completely to other uh, caffeinated uh, beverages such as tea or Coca-Cola. And, and that is very true. I also do it. Uh, mostly when I go to uh, McDonald's drive through in the morning, uh, I'm sure some people will, you know, be surprised. I'll say, can I please have uh, uh, McFist with Coke, no ice in the morning? Yes, I do that. So yes, we have people like me, like myself. Yes, we do drink uh, coffee in the morning. Yes, we do. Right. In uh, no, not coffee, Coke. <laughs> in general, the quantity of coffee beans or, or of any good or service uh, in, in general that people want to buy, taking want to mean willingness and ability, just like I said from the start. So willingness and ability to buy it depends on the price, just like we are saying there. So we don't just merely uh, take whatever it is that consumers have bought and then multiply that by uh, the number of days in a year and say, okay, so this is the total demand. That demand would be different if uh, the price was not where it was. So price plays a, a significant role in uh, the quantity that is demanded. Of course, uh, let's look at the two words, willingness and ability. Okay, let's say, uh, okay, uh, like I said, I said uh, ability means I have the money, right? And willingness means I want the thing. Uh, but it doesn't stay the same. Okay, let me say this is a cup of coffee and... Um, and it costs maybe what 12 rand now i have 20000 in my account so at the end of the day i'm able to buy even if the price was 48 rand but the question is if the price is 48 rand i am still able because i have more than enough to buy uh, even 15 of them but I won't be, I won't buy it because at that price, I'm not willing. Like, I don't think it's worth it. That's the point. I, I, I would rather do something with that 48 rand. It takes us to other terms, you know, we don't want to confuse you. But yes, it, it takes us to maybe utility. I, I'm not going to think, I, I don't think uh, the, 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 the cup of coffee is going to satisfy me to that point where I have to spend 48 rand. But if I, if I felt like the satisfaction is going to be extremely, you know, up there, like, I don't know how many utils, uh, you know, I would probably spend that 48 rand. So let's not, let's not complicate things. Uh, I just want you to understand what we mean here by willingness and ability. Okay. So moving on, the higher the price, the less of the, the good or service people want to purchase. Alternatively, the lower the price, the more they want to purchase. So already uh, it's saying something about the relationship between price and demand. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, the higher the price, so when price is high, the less of the good people want to purchase. So this want to purchase is what we are saying, demand. Oh, so already you see what is the relationship between price and demand. What is the relationship? Uh, we say the relationship is inverse. Okay. When this one is high, the other one is low. When this one gets low, the other one gets high. So the, the, they will never go hand in hand. Uh, so we say that the relationship between price and demand is uh, inverse. So they have an inverse relationship. Right. So to answer the question, so the answer to the question, how many kilograms of coffee beans consumers want to buy obviously depends on the price of coffee beans, just like we've been saying. So if you don't know, um, 
what the price will be you can start by making a table and uh, a table of how many kilograms of coffee beans uh, people would want to buy at a number of different prices and we call that table a demand schedule okay so we're going to construct such uh, uh, such a table yes is known as a demand schedule just like i said so this in turn can be used to draw a demand curve so we can use the demand schedule so it's just a table with some numbers showing you know and and obviously you'll see that it makes a lot of sense uh how we put those numbers together so let's have a look at um we'll do it just now okay All right so a demand schedule is a table showing how much of a good or service consumers will want to buy at different prices so that's exactly what it does on the right side of the the graph that i'll show just now um i show a hypothetical demand schedule for coffee beans okay yes obviously why am i saying it's a hypothetical one it's obviously not using uh, a real data so i'm just going to make these numbers up and obviously i'll try to make sure that the numbers make as much sense as possible okay so let's have a look at our demand schedule so we have the coffee beans right let's have a look and let's try to discuss this um this demand schedule so first we want to talk about the demand schedule and we want to see how that can be used to plot a graph okay so let's see uh first and foremost um I, I can say let's let's start off with our price here so this is our price uh just like we said uh that it will depend on the price so i just want to start with the price okay so this as you can see is a price which is high and this you can see it's a price which is low so 20 rand the that is per kilogram of coffee beans so if coffee beans were were, were being sold at 20 rand that would obviously affect the the, the price of these coffee beans uh, the the quantity uh of coffee beans demanded but let's have a look and see how how will it affect that okay so let's assume that at 20 rand per kilogram of coffee beans 8 billion kilograms will be demanded okay but how, what would happen if the price was to drop uh, to drop down to 17 rand 50 for for example look what happens the quantity demanded would go up it goes to say the relationship between price and quantity demanded is inverse just like i said earlier what if the price was to drop again from 15 rand to um uh, from 17 rand 50 to 15 rand look at what happens the price the quantity demanded of coffee beans would increase to nine rand all right let's start low let's start at five rand what if the price of uh coffee beans was five rand per okay the um, quantity demanded will be 11 billion kgs all right what if the price was to go up from five rand to uh seven rand fifty you see the quantity demanded would drop from 11 billion to 10.5 billion kgs demanded let's say on a daily basis all right do you see the relationship what if the price would go up again from seven rand fifty to ten rand uh, the quantity demanded would go down so do you see that uh, these things are just going in opposite direction when price goes up quantity demanded goes down when price goes down quantity demanded goes up this is not rocket science so let's now uh have a look at this so do you see that uh we take this 20 it's this 20 rand here and this eight it's uh how do i go there okay let me go around it's this eight here so this is eight billion kilograms of coffee beans demanded let's say per day and this here is 20 rand so the two will intersect at this dot here 
okay if we draw a line going up and we draw a line going to the right they will intersect at this point here so we will put a dot there then we look here at uh, 17 rand 50 uh, 17 rand 50 will be this amount here then we take this 8.5 billion kgs it's this 8.5 billion and then where do the two meet the two intersect at this dot here so we continue doing that dot dot so these are the dots you see here they show us the price and the quantity demanded uh, so that is where they meet so we then connect these dots and then we have what we call a demand curve so uh, if you remember when we started i drew a line that was going down and i drew a line that was going up then i said which one do you think is a demand curve so as you can see here a demand curve is that which is downward sloping okay we are going to talk about other things as we progress as you learn more about the demand curve we are going to see that we have something that we call movement along the demand curve we have something that we call shifting of the demand curve it's not for today's lesson you are going to learn it um, in other lessons to come all right so here it's just an explanation of the uh, the table that we just had so there's no need for me to go through this because that's exactly what i was doing all right so in other words as the price rises the quantity demanded of coffee beans the actual amount consumers are willing to buy at uh, at some specific price will fall so again the fall means down and the rise means obviously up so we are having this thing here Right, the graph uh, I just showed you is a visual representation of the information in the table. So the table is what we call the what? The demand schedule or the demand schedule. Some call it schedule, but yeah, I pronounce it as schedule. Right, uh, the, then the vertical axis shows the price. Okay, fine, we did this. So I wasn't supposed to go through this again. Uh, the curve that connects these points is the demand curve. Yes, I explained that. So a demand curve is a graphical representation of the demand schedule. So we're not going to walk around talking about the table because in the table we have numbers and so on, but it will make, uh, it will clear, clarify things if we were to, to, to draw a graph. You know, in economics, we try to simplify things uh, by using graphs because those graphs will make things make a lot of sense All right so that is uh the so the demand curve is the graphical representation of the demand schedule which helps us clarify things another way of showing the relationship between the quantity demanded and the price so take note that the demand curve shown in the graph is downward sloping and i i mentioned that uh, point so this reflects the general uh, proposition uh, that a higher price reduces the quantity demanded for example some people would drink two cups of coffee a day when beans are 10 uh, 10 rand per kilogram will cut down the uh, to one cup when the price doubles to two rand per kilogram that makes absolute sense so similarly uh, some who drink one cup when beans are 10 rent will do the opposite though uh, oh, actually not that similarly some who drink one cup sorry i thought i'm uh, i'm saying something which is different but it's still the same thing uh, will drink tea instead so some people will drink less and some will completely do away with uh, that Okay, so in the real world, demand curves almost always, and we are saying almost always because maybe, uh, you know, something weird could happen, but it's very, very rare to such a point that it makes sense for us to just ignore that. Uh, I, I can't even imagine how it could happen, but then let's come to the conclusion that it almost always slopes downward. If you see it doing something else, I don't know what it is and I don't know what's causing it. So generally the proportion that a higher price for a good, um, all other things equal. Okay, let me just explain that ceteris paribus 
uh, for, a, for, a, for a minute, okay? So for us to understand this term, ceteris paribus, or paribus, ceteris, some, some call it ceteris paribus, uh, some call it ceteris paribus, it's a Latin uh, phrase that simply means uh, everything else uh, constant or, or everything else stays the same. They also make use of this term in maths, but we use it also in economics to simplify terms because if we don't hold other things constant, we wouldn't really know what is causing. In this case, uh, we, we're talking about demand and supply, right? So demand tends to shift in some cases, supply shifts also in some cases, but what is causing the demand to shift? For us to understand the cause of the shift or the movement along the demand curve or the movement along the supply curve or the increasing in supply or decrease in supply, for us to understand why price has gone up or down, we have to do something which is hold other things constant. Well, for you to understand what I mean by that, holding other things constant or making sure that other things stay the same, uh, I'm going to give you an example. All right, so let's say we have two dogs and we give, if I use dogs, it will sound cruel because one of the two must die, so maybe not. Let me use flowers instead. So assume we have two plants that are identical, okay, from the same seed, from the same plant. Now we give these two plants the same conditions. We give them uh, the same wind, we give them the same temperature, we give them the same nutrients, the same fertilizer, yeah, that's nutrients. And the only thing that is different with these two plants is that the other one is sunlight, the other one we deprive it of sunlight, right? So we put these two plants in two separate places. Obviously the one has to be where, the sun, where there is no sunlight, the one has to be where there is sunlight. So we put these uh, plants uh, in these two different places. But remember, everything else, we try to ensure that everything else is the same. The only difference is the, the lack of sunlight on one of the plants. Then let's say after a week or so, the plant that we deprived of sunlight dies. It is easy for us to conclude and say this plant died because of lack of sunlight. But if we don't hold other things constant, for instance, uh, if uh, this other plant has everything sunlight and everything the way it is, and the other plant we deprive it of water and sunlight, and then it dies, after a week, are we going to come to the conclusion and say that the plant died because of lack of sunlight? Because it could have died because of the lack of water. So for us to make sure we understand exactly what caused the shift, now I'm back to economics, uh, of the demand curve or supply curve, then we have to hold other things constant for us to come with a reasonable conclusion and say the reason why this uh, plant died is lack of sunlight because if we deprive it of water again, maybe water killed it. So for us to understand, I think you understand me, we have to hold other things constant. And the term that we use is ceteris paribus. All right, I think you, whenever I say ceteris paribus in grade 11, in grade 12, you are going to understand what I'm referring to. Thank you so much. Let's proceed. Leads people Okay, let me, let me just come back to the whole sentence now that you understand what ceteris paribus from my example means. Okay, so generally the proportion, uh, the, 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 the proportion that a higher price for a good or other things equal leads people to demand a smaller quantity of that uh, good is so reliable that economists are willing to call it a law and what kind of a law do we uh, is this it's called the law of demand okay so it will it will always uh, whenever i say what does the law of demand mention so you you will always know what it means okay so let's go down to our homework now list the five key elements in the demand and supply model what determines the quantity of goods and services that consumers want to buy Define the phrase demand schedule in your own words, please. What is a demand curve? What does a downward sloping demand curve represent? Is it always the case that demand is downward sloping? Substantiate your answer. Define the phrase ceteris 
Paribus. All right, thank you so much, uh, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'll see you in the next lesson. As always, please don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Uh, there is more that is upcoming. As you can see, this is just the introduction to the demand schedule, uh, to the demand curve. You want to know how it shifts. You also want to know about the supply curve. You want to know about equilibrium. So thank you so much.